Welcome to Community Matters on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Jay Fidel. Today, we're going to talk about what it's like in Stuck Elevator, a modern American opera presented by Hawaii Opera Theater. Our guest for the show is Andrew Morgan, General Director of the Hawaii Opera Theater. Welcome to the show, Andrew. Thanks, Jay. It's a pleasure to be here. So nice to have you. So nice to be able to have this conversation, uh, you know, surrounded by the intensity of, of all the election news. This is like an island in the storm, if you don't mind. <laughs> Art saves us in so many ways. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. I want to talk about that yeah. because opera, you know, saves me. I go to the opera and I always. Um, I'm transported. I, I'm in an alternative universe that that pleases me. It's uh, and I do have emotional reactions every time. Yeah. So um, I I think I'm doing the right thing. I let myself open to it, which is exactly what I did in Stuck Elevator. That's totally the right thing, Jay. Yeah. I mean, opera. I, I, all theater it can be impactful, but for me, opera just is like the the next level of that impactfulness because the music is just so expansive and and it, you know it tells the story as much as the words do, and so you really get carried away. And just the power of the human voice is to me very special. You know, I, I've been uh, thinking that some of the you know some of the music in operas, especially in the ABC famous ones. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> you know, are, are memorable songs. And, you know, you, some of them you might even hum walking down the street. Oh, but, sure. you know, that's not necessarily ironclad because yeah. you can find an opera, including a modern, modern day American opera like Stuck Elevator. <laughs> no. Yeah, no, it, it's full of earworms, as I like, to, it, it, as they say these, you know, it's, a, it's, it's got one tune after another. And sure, you know, some of it was hip hop, and that's not very hummable. But, um, but also just these great ballads and arias and just beautiful music, very t touch, touching. <laughs> what, <laughs> what makes Stuck Elevator different? It's certainly unusual for Hawaii Opera Theater. What makes it different and special? The difference is that it it tells a story in a, a, an amazing blend of musical genres. There is opera, there's musical theater, there's hip hop um, with rap rap songs and things, and and it does it in one of the most fluid ways of any piece I've ever experienced. I mean, you just you don't feel like this. Um, you don't feel it disjointed. It just goes from one scene to the next, and yet. It takes you on this roller coaster of emotions um, as you experience this 81 hours of being stuck in an elevator over 81 minutes of music. It's really just an amazing piece. I wondered actually watching it how you found it, mm -hmm. uh, why you selected it in the first place, you know, what kind of exposure you had to it to begin with. I, I know it emanated from Nashville, uh, which is kind of a blue pocket in a red state. Um, so query, how did you connect with it? Did you wake up in the morning at, at three o'clock in the morning and say, hmm, we have to do Stuck Elevator? <laughs> I do wake up at three o'clock in the morning a lot of times, but not in this particular instance. Um, it was actually brought to us, uh, brought to my attention by our artistic director, Jamie Offenbach, who has known John Humes, uh, the he's the artistic director and CEO at Nashville Opera, and he directed this piece for us and for Nashville. Um, he had found out about this piece from, from John um, and brought it to me, and I thought, this is just perfect for us. Because one of the things that we're really trying to do with this company is make it more relevant to the communities we serve. And, you know, opera, the ABCs, they're, they're very much a European tradition that that is kind of a round peg in a square hole here in Hawaii, you know, long history of Hawaii here. But but again, how do we attract new audiences and, and, and younger audiences that that might not gravitate towards um, a woman in a breastplate and horns or, um, you know, that the kind of the mythological or bigger than life stories that opera tells so well, but it also can tell very poignant and personal stories of real individuals. Um, and, and in this particular instance, something that was based on an actual story, uh, a, a real thing that happened to somebody uh, in a New York uh, elevator in the Bronx in uh, 2004. Can you flesh that out uh, and, and, and tell us the story of Stuck Elevator? 
Sure. Um, so it tells a story. <clears throat> Guang is our lead character, and he is based on a real uh, person, uh, undocumented immigrant, um, that had this happen to him. Um, but then the rest of it is a flight of fancy of the composer and the librettist, um, except that he got out alive. Um, so he is a Chinese food delivery man, and he's working his way out of really an insurmountable debt to the human traffickers that got him into the country, um, like $120,000 for him and his nephew to get in from China to the U.S. Us. Um, he's paid off quite a bit of it, but it's still like eighty thousand dollars left, and that's on top of the nephew having passed away on the on the stuck in a stuck in, another stuck stuck in a container ship with no light, air, or water. Um, so, anyways, that. that He's he's trying to pay this off, and he's he has sold his phone uh, to a colleague at the the Chinese deliver Chinese food a Chinese restaurant that he's working with as a delivery man. So he he doesn't have a cell phone with him. Um, he goes up to the thirty fifth floor and makes the delivery of these food, and then goes back down. and It's an express elevator. That's that's uh, uh, actually somewhat a key part of this. Um, so he gets back on the elevator. The doors close, and it doesn't go anywhere, it doesn't move. And then finally it does, but it plunges like 20 floors. Um, it stops and then plunges another 10 floors. And so he's stuck between the third and the fourth floor, but the elevator has no, there's no openings between the first and the 21st floor in this particular shaft. Um, it is taking place over a holiday weekend. He's making the delivery uh, on a Friday evening. He's not rescued until Tuesday morning because everything is closed on Monday for a holiday. Um, he presses the inner, well, actually in our story, the, the story of the opera, he's afraid to press the, the button, the intercom button, because he's undocumented and he's afraid that the police will come to rescue him, ask for his papers, and he won't have any until he'll be deported. Um, in the, the, the factual story, he does press the intercom, but the, it's so staticky and he only speaks a very specific dialect of Chinese, Fujian, um, that they can't understand him. And the security guard thinks it's a prank. Wow. Of course, it, both stories talk about the the uh, the video in the the camera in the elevator being broken, and that also that was also true. Um, and so no one knew he was there. Um, in the in the real story, there was actually a, a manhunt put out for him because the the. The, the restaurant, he never got back and he was supposed to make many more deliveries and very reliable. And they're like, what, what the heck happened? Um, and so the police are investigating. They, they visited like 840 apartments in the building that he was making the delivery for and like looking in the river nearby. I mean, just all this manhunt for him. And yet he was stuck in this, in the building the whole time. And he has nothing with him because he's dropped off the food. He's got some soy sauce packets, hot sauce packets, and a fortune cookie, and that's it. <laughs> and so the story progresses. It's like the the, the theory, the 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 um, what the the librettist and composer decide is like what would happen if you're stuck in an elevator for eighty one hours? Where would you go mentally? And so he starts off having, you know, just conversations with himself about his plight and all, but then starts imagining conversations with other characters. So the opera has five singers. One is Guang, who's on stage the entire opera that can't leave at all. And then four other singers that play different roles in his life and fantastical figures as well, because he certainly has flights of fancy. Um, but he, he, he has conversations with his wife and a uh, eight year old son that are left in back in China. Um, the, the guy that he sold his phone to the trafficker that he owes all this money to. Um, there's uh, immig ICE immigration uh, and customs enforcement officers that, that beat him up in one scene. Um, but he also has these his hysterical experiences like um, going into a, a, a casino and betting on uh, all this money that he's earned that turns out actually is just a menu that a takeout memory menu that he has with him, um, a, a, a lucha libre style cage match between the elevator and a fortune cookie that is just brilliant. You know, I mean, it that's that's what you would fantasize about, are things that are with you, right? Um, as you as you kind of go into delusional um, fatigue, um, but in the end, thankfully, he does survive the ordeal and um, the elevator doors open. In the real story, he's actually rescued by the mechanic in the building. Um, but anyways, and he goes on. I'm, I'm droning on, but I'll keep talking just a little bit more. So stop me if you want to ask another question. But um, one of the one of the brilliant things that the 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 director, John Hume, said that I think is really fascinating is in a normal 
th theatrical piece. Uh, there's going to be an arc of the character. They learn something. They meet people. They go on a journey and, and are changed by the experience. And with Guang, it there is no arc to the story. He, he maybe changes, but what really changes is our perception of him as an audience member. There's delivery people that go by us all the time, Uber drivers or, or um, Uber Eats or DoorDash or whatever. Um, and you don't know them. They just hand you the wrap package and they go on their merry way. You don't know who they are as a person, what their fears are, what their hopes and dreams are. And so we as the audience member get to learn about him. We learn that this is a person that, yes, he's undocumented, but he's a human being. He has family that he loves. He has friends that he's made since he moved to the U.S. He has fears of being deported, of, of being beaten up by police officers or others. Um, there is, and this is actually factual in the story, um, there was a series of um, murders of, of delivery men at that time in New York City. They were being robbed for the, because they would carry a lot of cash um, on them. And so they would be robbed for that. And if they, if they, resisted that they would get stabbed and he that, that's actually one of the fantasy one of the, the experiences that he relives of him getting held up at knife point um and losing two hundred dollars and then having to pay the two hundred dollars back to his boss so in effect he was out four hundred dollars we were sitting up close and i was as immersed as i have ever been in an opera but it was moving so fast there were so many things going on uh, that you know i didn't catch all the things you just described yeah, yeah when is it coming back andrew oh that's a good question i don't know um we don't usually repeat things like this but it certainly would be one i would i wouldn't mind bringing back probably not for several seasons though because we've got other things we've got planned so i'm sure of course you know this was a perfect opera for a perfect time you know where they call it the political dynamic of the country yeah um and it was a perfect opera for hawaii yeah. Uh, you know, to, to understand better the, the Chinese situation and the immigration, migration. I, I, and there's a large Chinese population here, of course. She started as a, as a work of musical theater. Um, uh, that, that was their original vision, the composer Byron O. Young and the librettist Aaron Jeffress. Um, and it was premiered at uh, San Francisco's American Conservatory Theater, ACT. And then it kind of sat for a while, just un, undiscovered. But John had heard somebody, well, actually the, the original tenor, um, Julius Ahn, um, uh, told him about it. And he's like that, and it just stuck in his head that he was working on this. And so he, he, he contacted the composer, didn't know the composer and started talking about, would you be interested in, in kind of adapting this to more of an operatic story, uh, a way of telling a story? And he was, and they did. They um, So that was what we produced. And that's what Nashville Opera produced in, back in January, 2023. And so we brought to here in Honolulu. You set up a, a panel afterward, and you chaired the panel. Well, that panel program really brought home the relevance. Um, you had uh, you had three people who were involved in uh, human trafficking, yeah, and um, and, uh, and the whole Chinese uh, experience. You had that fellow Yume, who I thought was a wonderful, brilliant guy, the conductor of the orchestra who uh, reminded us that a bicycle wheel was included in the orchestra. And a gong submerged in water. That was one of my books, too. <laughs> a creativity everywhere. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> you know, Andrew, when I got in, as soon as I sat down, I looked at the, you know, the uh, elevator set. And um, I said, oh, my God, they're going to do this in, in front of an elevator set the whole time. That's like claustrophobic. But <laughs> I was so wrong about that. Because no sooner than I than I sat down was I realized, and they showed me, you showed me, that you could make um, with high tech monitors as a back as a backdrop, you could do any kind of imagery you wanted, yeah. and this was fantastic and high resolution. Yeah, just beautiful. The original production in Nashville, they use rear projection, um, so a. a thrusting it on, on a screen from the back. But we can't do that at the arena. And so we thought, well, we can do digital walls. And so that's what we did. And I think it, it, they agreed too that uh, John and Dean from Nashville, they they thought it worked much better that way. The contrast was, was as you say, was just spectacularly beautiful. You know, I thought to myself, this is a statement, and there's many statements here, but this is a statement of the way opera will be. You, you need less backstage. 
Um, all you need is those monitors and something to drive the graphics on them. And you can do any kind of background, any kind of set you want, really. Oh, and, yeah. And it looks beautiful. It, it also lets you go from scene to scene very quickly, which which happens in, in Stock Elevator, because he the, each of his little vignettes are two or three minutes long, and then he's jumping to another scene talking to somebody else. And yet you keep yeah. going back to the elevator as a reminder that he's not left. <laughs> and, and there were very quick uh, costume changes, too, as I recall. Yes, I, I think the shortest one is like 40 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> Got to be quick. Yes. So what, what were the production issues? I mean, you had some really talented people on the stage. Um, uh, some of them were from the Nashville production, I guess, maybe all of them. Three of the five. Um, three of the five, yeah. Three of the five. Yeah. And and the five all had such uh, what you call, projecting personalities. Oh, yeah. Um, I, I really enjoyed them. And I enjoyed them in part because they were only a few inches away from me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Well, certainly, you know, part of the challenges of doing anything at a space like the arena is the challenges of doing at a large space like the arena. So we have, uh, we would normally in opera don't mic our, our singers, we don't amplify, um, but we have to in a space like that. Um, we had to, to amplify the orchestra too, there's just four players off to the side. <clears throat> and so there, that adds to the challenge. And of course the arena um, doesn't have any infrastructure that a normal theater would have. And so we had to put in, bring in rigging and lighting, um, build a stage for the production. Um, so it adds to the cost and the, and the logistical challenges of it. Um, but I think the, the, the challenges were worth overcoming for that, that production. I think it worked beautifully in that space. I'm wondering actually uh, whether that space, believe it or not, now you can disagree, that space would have been better, was better. Yeah. Um, than the full Blaisdell concert halls. Yeah, I totally agree. I think it, it was, um, it's a it's a gritty piece and I think you would have lost some of that feeling and also being closer to the action um, with the Blaisdell, even if we didn't open up the orchestra pit and push everything to the front, there's still going to be a wide separation between you and, and the action. Um, and, and also you, you, I think there's some expectations. I, I know there are expectations when you go into a theater like the Blaisdell of what it's going to look like and feel like. And you might have resistance to something that looks like we the production that we did with Stock Elevator. Whereas in a place like the arena, you're like, you're going, is it what is it going to be? I've, I've seen a basketball tournament here. And maybe if I'm old enough, I've seen Elvis perform there. <laughs> but um, you know, it it can be anything you want. And there so you 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 lose that preconceived notions of what it's going to be like. This tells me a few things about what I perceive to be the future of opera in this country. I'm not sure about Europe. I would like your view to compare. But what I what I was so impressed with was it hit issues that are relevant to our times. Yeah. Big issues, huge issues, issues that will change the world, that are changing the world. That is really something. Um, and that's different than something that was written in the 18th century or before. The political message at the time, they're just lost to us now. Yes, yes, agreed. The other thing is that the technology um, and, and the, the stage play, the way people moved, uh, the notion of you know, looking back into this dreamlike recollection of how his life was and the things that were important to him and taking him as a character and introducing him so you meet him. And you you study him, you yeah. examine him, and by the end of the opera, you feel you really know the man. And I'm thinking to myself, there are elements in Stuck Elevator that that you know inform us mm -hmm. as to the future of opera in general. The part that appeals to new generations, uh, the the part that uh, comports with other art uh, that is in in sync with with modern events. What are your thoughts about that? Yeah, no, I think I think opera it has been evolving for the last ten years, maybe twenty years, um, but it it's been um, exponentially faster since COVID. Um, of the need, to, the, the desire to 
be more relevant to audiences to get them back to, into the theater. Um, whereas it's like, okay, I saw, Car I mean, we're doing Carmen, so I won't diss Carmen, but um, I'm not, I don't diss any traditional opera. I think it still has a huge place in our, in our repertoire and will have, but we also have to be telling stories that are, are more contemporary, more relatable, um, or even telling the old stories in ways that are more contemporary and relatable. But you're right. It, it is. And I, and I, I actually wouldn't call this piece avant-garde, but it, at least in what I think of as avant-garde, which means difficult to listen to and, and impossible to understand. Um, <laughs> maybe esoteric is a better word for that sort of thing. Um, but you. it is avant-garde in the way it, it breaks down the barrier between musical theater and opera, um, which has been a which has been a battle for many years. And even I mean, I mean, Mozart, you know, the magic flute is kind of a precursor to Broadway, the, the early Broadway, you know, with the, the the spoken word and and more hummable melodies and little set pieces and things, um, and so I think we're kind of getting we're getting back to that in some ways of an understanding that things have to be listenable, approachable, um, but also tell a compelling story because opera has to have big ideas uh, to be an opera. It has to have a bigger message and a and a larger human understanding to be opera. And I think this, I think Stuck Elevator has that. Guang does become bigger than life and the way his, the way his fantasies play out are bigger than life. And yet he's, a, he's a real individual. I mean, you can, like you said, you can relate to him. You can understand him as, and him as a person in a way that you probably don't understand Tosca by the end of Tosca. Maybe you do, um, but differently. So let's talk about Hawaii Upper Theater for a minute. Mm -hmm. uh, what's your season like this year, and uh, how are you evolving? I care uh, a lot about Hawaii Opera Theater. Thank you, Jay. I care a lot about it, too. I feel the weight of the history of this company on my shoulders of being around since 1961. Um, and so I, you know, I wanted to get to the next century of, of its, its history. Um, and so we are, you know, we've been struggling since we came out of COVID, um, of audiences being slow to return, and then the the adding insult to injury with the Blaisdell Concert Hall being closed, um, what was supposed to be a year and is now looking like a year and a half, um, and it forced us to be think creatively, which is great. I mean, that that's what we should be doing. And so last season was in three operas in three different venues. Um, this season is two operas in two different venues. <clears throat> it was We were supposed to be back in the concert hall in February for production that I, I was directing um, of uh, an English adaptation of it, Rossini's Italian Girl in Algiers called Riot Girl on Mars. Um, so we did push that back. <laughs> push that ahead until February 2026. So we'll be doing it, just not this season. It's a piece that that because, I mean, comedy with chorus, it really couldn't fit anywhere else with a full orchestra too. Um, the arena, we did Pagliacci, which had a chorus, but th that was able to work in kind of the avant-garde setting with it. But comedy, you need, the, the chorus is part of the comedy in Italian Girl in Algiers. You know, they're the lackeys and the prisoners and all of that sort of thing. Anyways, um, so, but we are, are proceeding with our April production, which will be back in the concert hall, knock on something, um, uh, in April. And that is uh, a staged concert version of Carmen. So the orchestra will be on the stage, but all the, the, the cast will be in costumes and, and acting out the, the drama in, right up close to the audience. Well, it's a blessing to have art here. I, uh, I said before, my recollection is that a great state needs great art and great art makes a great state. Uh, your thoughts about that? I, I, I mean, it, you, that's exactly what I say too, Jay. <laughs> <laughs> it, it is the arts do make a community. I mean, it, it's what, it, what, it's what makes us human, and and it's a way to explore our humanity. Whether it's uh, a painting at the Honolulu Museum of Art or, or Modern Capital, ballet at Ballet Hawaii, the Nutcracker, or the Symphony, the Opera, all, and all the wonderful theaters we have around Diamond Head, Manoa Valley Theater, Kumukuhua. You know, there's just amazing art happening right here. And what what astounds me or, or impresses me, and having moved here, I've been here now five and a half years or so, um, is this is a relatively small community. The Metropolitan is what, 800, 900,000 um, Honolulu, and Yet we have world-class music here, theater. Um, it's really, it's really powerful. And I think it, it is what part of what makes this this place special. On top of the wonderful many things that make Hawaii special, it's just an add-on, not a but or an or. 
Yeah, sure. Well, let's talk about some of the elements that feed into Hawaii Opera Theater. Of course, you know, you, you have the players. Some of them are local. A lot mm -hmm. of them come in. You have to recruit them from who knows where, anywhere, including, you know, the mainland and Europe, for, for example. I've met some of them. They're really interesting and charming. Yeah. Um, then uh, you you have, of course, the orchestra, which is always a, a special element, may I say. Yeah. Um, you you have the, the uh, st stage designers. Uh, I think with, with this modern technology, that may change in some way. Yeah. Um, you have the dancers who, who come from what ballet Hawaii or other dance yeah. institutions. Um, what did I what did I skip here? There must be half a dozen other uh, you know arts and skills that sure. feed into any production. Am I right? Yeah, I mean the art opera is the most complete art form, and so it's got the costumes and the sets and the music, the the words, the dancing. It it's all those things, um, and it it takes it's it's a because of that it's also the most expensive art form there's a lot of people that have to go into making an opera production even a small one like stock elevator it's a lot of people working on that from makeup artists to people that uh, design and, and put on wigs and um the sound guy that because it had to be amplified and the orchestra it's just a cast of hundreds if not thousands um and you know we do rely on some on volunteers but we we also have uh, a, it's a professional opera company and so we do pay when i got here in 2019 we were bringing in a lot from the mainland um and i pushed against that notion because there are like we were bringing in stage managers and assistant stage managers and there are really talented people here that that can do those jobs so why wouldn't we engage them um we've developed a really wonderful relationship with comes from the faculty at uh manoa um, michelle bisbee worked some on this production even though it was from a design at nashville opera um and she's a, a theater a designer on a scenic designer on the a faculty at uh we've worked with a costume designer from there too lighting designers um you know we are we are expanding who we who we think of as creators of opera right here in opera right right here in hawaii um but there are some things that do have to be brought in you know we we don't have a large pool of professional level singers here we've got some amazing sopranos uh that we use and and mezzos our own Blythe Kelsey who's on our staff um but we are, there's a dearth of male singers here. And so we do bring in the cast of, of Stuck Elevator. Um, I mean, the, the lead, Taka Gomagata, who played Guang, um, he lives here part-time and, and he's just astounds me every time I see him on stage. I mean, the, we've, we've really, it's wonderful to see him grow from the, the little production of Mozart's Bastien and Bastien I directed for our, our digital season to being on stage for an hour and a half in this amazing and complicated role as Guang in Stuck Elevator. Um, but the rest of the cast were, were visiting artists. Um, and as you, as you noted, three three of them uh, were in the original um, Nashville Opera production. The soprano, Helen Jibing Wong, uh, we, we selected her for the other sopr the soprano that Nashville had used. Um, she was in our American Dream last October and just blew us away with her her voice. She's such a tiny, I mean, so skinny and petite and this big, gorgeous voice comes out of that little body. And she's also just a delight to work with. So that that was, that's how we put a cast together. We're saying we're, we're looking for a person, we're certainly voice, voice first, you know, suitability for the role, but also we want somebody that's gonna get along with us and each other, you know. The the days of kind of like in the restaurant business where the 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 terror chef is no longer acceptable. <laughs> the, the, the diva the diva fits are not acceptable either. We no one wants to put up with that. The cast gets upset by that too, just as much as the as the staff do of trying to manage that kind of personality. Yeah. It's an emotional experience for everybody. It is, yeah. yeah. And we've really been blessed with with some super cohesive cast like like Stuck Elevator. I mean, they were they were going out with each other doing touristy things and and all in between rehearsals. And so it's it's great to see that bond built. Um the one last thing I wanted to ask you about is, you know, here we have an operator that emanated out of Nashville coming to Hawaii. That is something. And we have uh, players that come and we have, you know, various experts that come as as and when necessary. And we you know, produce, you produce these very professional productions. <clears throat> but you're part of a community, um, and it's a at least a national community. It, it may be, uh, maybe I would say it's a global community if you wrap, uh, you know, Europe, for example, into it. Um, and so you have to get out there and you have to know 
the other opera companies, the other general directors of all the opera companies. You have to know the players. You have to follow the action, read the publications, what have you. This, this has got to be a very interesting and stimulating position. It's not just that you're managing the development of a given opera or season uh, and all these people and all these skills. You have to reach out everywhere. Um, what's that like? And what do they think of us? Yeah. Well, I mean, it, it's, um, well, first I'll say with that, we we have a very good reputation. The artists that come here, whether it's the directors, conductor, um, the cast members, we definitely show them the Aloha spirit. We we treat them well and they go away all universally asking, when can we come back? When can we come back to Hawaii? Obviously it's a magical place, but but we also make sure that that our company is part of that magic. Um and we are we are we have a good reputation in the opera world, at least the United States. I'm not sure how well we're known globally, but but we are we're out there. Um, and I, I think that we're, we have commissioned two new operas coming up in future seasons that I think will also help put us on the global map, which is good, uh, exciting time for the company. But um, yeah, I mean, it, it is a position and, and I'm thankful to have dedicated and qualified staff like Jamie is our artistic director, but it is a, it is constantly having to look 10 or 12 steps ahead. Um, and you're right, keeping up with what's going on in the industry. We're fortunate to, um, to be members and, and I'm on the board of Opera America, which is a national service organization for professional opera companies. Um, and they're hooked to your Opera Europa and Opera Canada, a lot of, you know, come uh, and also Asia uh, connections as well. And so that also helps us keep connected to the opera world outside this, this wonderful little island. You are really the perfect individual to do this. There's a certain modesty about you. There's a certain humility. At the same time, you are on it. You're on every little detail. And opera is a study of detail, right? Isn't it? Sure it? Is. Yeah. I think that comes from my being a stage director myself. So <laughs> there you go. Have to watch every little detail. Yeah. When you when you get up in front of in front of the audience, um, you know, to 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 open the proceedings, so to speak, I'm I'm always encouraged. I say, wow, you have to know that a lot of people enjoy your style when you get up and say hi. And the other thing is the panel you set up was extraordinary and your moderation of that panel. I mean, we do a lot of moderating panels here at ThinkTech. And, and I must say, your moderation of that panel was really, really perfect. I always enjoy when somebody um, gets up and uh, at, like on, on the uh, lanai uh, in Blaisdell and gives us a little praise about what's gonna happen uh, and people can get a, a better handle on it. It's great. But on the other hand, the panel afterward, that was that was a real blessing um, because then you can you can look back and touch it again and, and incorporate the thoughts, maybe assimilate what you just saw. And I think it also helps us put it into context of, of the situation here in Hawaii, you know, because it is a political, um, it, it is a is a real thing that happen is happening now. There are human trafficking issues here on Hawaii, and so I, I think it's any time we can tie it into what's going on here, the better, and for our audiences and for us as a company, so that we're doing is relevant and important. Thank you for doing all of this, Andrew. Thank you for your service to the arts and the community. Um, and I hope we get a chance to have another show with you soon. I would like to do that and I'll be I'll see you at the opera because you're always there. And and Thank when you. I walk in and I see your smiling face, I know I'm at home. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're so sweet. Thank you, Jay. And I really appreciate all your support too. Everything that Think Tech Hawaii does um, for the community is just really very much appreciated. It's, it's great. Thank you. Andrew Morgan, General Director of the Hawaii Opera Theater. Thank you so much. My pleasure, Jake. Thank you. Aloha.